so our next speaker, we are super excited to have Professor Andrew Morris, Andrew D. Morris, uh, from the UK here. Andrew is the director of HDR UK, and I am certain he will tell us about the vision and the scope of the fourth industrial revolution in the UK. So without further ado, Andrew. Thank you. Well, what a great pleasure it is to be in Washington. Uh, despite the two hours, may I say, I had to queue at Dulles last night with all the Brits. But, uh, but no, it's fine. Being British, we thought we can trump that. So, Eric, if you come on the 31st of October, you'll be queuing, you'll be, you'll be queuing for two days. So, uh, this, this is a great meeting. I think it is prescient. Uh, and I've been asked to do a national case study in our attempts, we're not there yet, to build a robust and trustworthy, I'm going to return to trust, a UK health data research infrastructure, and we hope that this will support the ICDA in its quest to see clinical translation. And I'm going to argue that we're going to need to see a convergence of care with research if we're going to realize uh, your ambitions. So that's what I'm going to do. And it really builds on the talks this morning of Nancy, Mark, and Rory. The exam question is, how can we develop a scalable outcomes phenotyping strategy? And I would argue it has to be digital. We can't do it manually. So that's the script, and I'll canter through this. So I'm going to tell you about how we're trying to gear an entire country for quality healthcare research and innovation. Data science is the catalyst for change. Uh, definitions are important. So my definition of data science is the interface between math, statistics, computational science, and domain, and our domain is uh, genetics and biomedical research. So shall we see, Eric, how many data scientists we have in the room? Any, any mathematicians? About six, so a cluster, seven. Any statisticians? You Rory, <laughs> you're an outlier, two or three. Um, computational scientists, that's not bad actually, and domain expertise, it's the rest of us. That's not bad, actually, uh, but in five years' time, the, the uh, equation should, should be balanced. I'm going to echo Gary and suggest the challenge is the phenotype, not the genotype in this world. And lastly, briefly talk about trust. But Francis teed me up. Why are we doing this? Why is the UK doing this? It's the fourth industrial revolution, as, as Francis outlined. Uh, there's no truth in the rumor that Eric remembers the mechanical loom, okay? <laughs> as, the, <laughs> as in the first industrial revolution. The fourth is not just a transition from automation. What we're seeing is a fusion of biology with computational sciences and physical sciences. It's affecting every industry in every country. The rate of change is exponential rather than linear, and it's very disruptive. So today in the UK, the big news story is that one of the largest travel countries in the world, uh, uh, travel companies in the world, has gone bust. It's called Thomas Cook. And the British government is repatriating 150,000 people back to the UK. Holidaymakers. It's the biggest movement of people in the UK since the Second World War. And that is happening today. And I would argue that's because of the fourth industrial revolution. It's also very disruptive. And it can disrupt markets, but also democracy. So our challenge is to deploy the fourth industrial revolution in healthcare in a trustworthy way, because it's coming. It's coming. And where are we? This is one of Aradazi's slide from Wish at Davos. He suggests that in terms of healthcare, in terms of data science, we're sort of mid-table. So we're like a Washington Redskins of, uh, uh, of performance. Or it does, it does pain me to say in the UK, we're like a Manchester United. They're not, they're, not, they're not doing as well as we could. So in the upper right quadrant, we have fintech and um, telecom. So how are we going to embrace this? This convergence of care and research is important. This is a busy slide, but I would argue if you look at some of the best performing health systems in the world, Nancy this morning gave us a very eloquent overview of uh, Vanderbilt. They focus on quality, they focus on leadership system governance, financial stability, but they have two things. Firstly, they have the whole system intelligence, primary, secondary, tertiary, and increasingly social care, monitored in real time through a comprehensive information infrastructure. 
And secondly, they bake in data science within their system. It's not a far-hand research endeavor. They have that expertise within the system so that every patient is a research patient. During the course of this meeting, the NHS in the UK will see two million people. So why shouldn't every one of those be research enabled? The other issue, and here's a fine picture of Rory, we're very proud of Biobank, is scale. So this is Framingham, where you sort of see the relationship between blood pressure and mortality. That's 50,000 people, and that's 500,000 people. So there's a great example of why scale is important. And we want to be able to run studies in the UK on up to 66 million people. 66 million people. The other issue is the economic part of this uh, equation. Our science is great in the UK, but we're really tough to do business with. So this is some work that Catapult did. They looked at UK SMEs, and they said, firstly, top left quadrant, how would UK samples and data help your R&D? About 80% said, yeah, it would be great. Secondly, how easy are we do, to do business with? About 75% said, we're really hard to do business with. Can't get access. The key is, on the right-hand panel, is that 80% um, of UK companies go abroad for access and samples, which is crazy. So how can we create a virtuous relationship? So we're asked to describe obstacles. So this is what keeps me awake at night in terms of phenotyping. Four key issues. Number one, data quality. Uh, I show a picture of um, Amy Abernethy and uh, Flatiron, because it's, it's created a lot of noise in the UK. It's sold for 2.1 billion people. As you know, it gives a very detailed, multimodal, longitudinal phenotype of cancer patients. So molecular data, imaging, mutation data. 2.1 million patients, 210 oncology practices. It's, it's uh, acquired by Roche. But what Amy said is we did the hard stuff. Everyone else says that is someone else's job. But it was sold for $2.1 billion. Now everyone thought this was AI in action, but actually it's a mechanical Turk. Does anyone you know what a mechanical Turk is? So that was invented by Wolfgang von Kempelen in 1770. And it was a big wooden box with a velvet cover which played chess and it beat Napoleon. It beat Benjamin Franklin at chess. And everyone thought it was automation, but actually it was a man inside, a grandmaster pulling the levers. Flatiron have a squadron of a thousand data curators who go around collecting detailed phenotype. And that's not sustainable. So we have issues in our own world. Uh, Jose will know you and Pearson. Mark will remember Ewan when we were doing metformin pharmacogenetics. Ewan emailed me and says, Andrew, this is the top 20 ways we prescribe metformin in the UK. And I said, that's very interesting. He said, this is the bottom 20 ways. And some of it is just a mixture of take one Twix a daily, one tablet. And actually, if you look for metformin alone, there were 5,700 ways. And this is not atypical. How can we have precision medicine without precision prescribing? So data quality is a big issue. We will only sort that when we address data, digital maturity of our health systems. This whole meeting is focused on personalized medicine and prescriptive analytics. But if our systems are going to be receptive, we've really got to work in partnership to drive digital maturity. The US is great in hospitals in some places, not so good in primary care. It's really the flip side in the UK. If you look at that scale in the UK, we're probably sitting at two to three in that digital maturity scale. So this is gonna be a big challenge for us if we're gonna do M2M2M. To M to M. We're pleased that in the UK now, we're putting a lot of resource and national consistency and coordination across standards and interoperability for the entire health system with standards baked into these systems, led by Matthew Gould. And I'm pleased to say we can do it. So this is a, a slide of GOSH, which has implemented its EPR. It's got an abstracted digital analytics environment. It's got 100 million data items going back to the year 2000, which are all fire aligned. And if you fire aligned, it means you can communicate a, a, a across the system with some really deep phenotypes. The third big issue, it's a complex environment. Um, 
And what I think we've really got to think of in terms of ICDA strategies, interoperability, to work across systems with no additional effort, is my definition. Um, currently, that's really hard, and we've got some great activities in the UK, but the prize is to be able to, to seamlessly ask questions across those multiple data controllers. So that depressed me a little, but then I went to Holland to give a talk, and they look exactly the same. So actually, the key here is those countries that can drive interoperability, this pre-competitive set of standards, governance standards, technical data standards, will, will, um, will actually achieve great things. And the last obstacle, well, it's not an obstacle, it's, it's important, it's trust. How do we do this, maintaining the public trust? This was a headline in the BBC just last week, Google swallows deep mind health. That was a big, big issue in the UK. To be trustworthy, you need to be honest, reliable, and competent, and also transparent. And as we've said, we need to work in partnership with Silicon Valley, but we need to think how do we do that in a trustworthy way so that we use personal data for the common good. And I'd be interested, this is a bit of a busy slide, this was just published last week from our Health Research Authority. They said, because we want to work in partnership with industry, at the beginning of some deliberative research, the HERA found that only 18% of participants were willing to share anonymized patient data with commercial organizations. One in five. That only increased to about 45% after a deliberative workshop. So I think we, you know, we, we need to be on the front foot on this issue and this concept of benefit share or value exchange is going to be absolutely critical as we, as we look to harness data at scale. And just to say that as part of our strategy, we, we engage the publics at every step of the way and they help us co-design our strategy moving forward as we look to use data on 66 million people at scale. So I just want to, sh that's really the what, the why, now is the how, is HDR UK. So our mission is to unite the UK's health data on 66 million people, and health data in its broadest sense, multidimensional, as well as environmental um, and societal, to enable discoveries that really improve patients' lives, people's lives. So we're an enabling organization. Our model might be of interest to you. So. Can I just credit the funders, you know, the Welcome, the MRC, British Heart Foundation, the Research Councils, they came together and they suggested we create a separate legal entity which is not a data controller and is institutionally agnostic. Because to try to do this from Oxford, Edinburgh, Leeds, would, or Cambridge would not work. So actually we sit in the Welcome Trust and we think that's important because it's independent. We don't want to control any data. What we do want to do is to be a focus of expertise plus the ability to drive interoperability in terms of data platforms, standards, governance, metadata dictionaries, etc. Our initial investment went from 37, about 120 million pounds. So it's not huge, but it's um, significant. And we're pretty young. We're only 511 days old. Biobanks. 4,874 days old. Rory, you're looking well on it, I must say. So, <laughs> so, um, so that, that's our model, and we want to stay really lean. We don't want to become bloated. But to do that, we've got a triple aim of science, people, and infrastructure. But the key thing we want to do is enable through an infrastructure. Data as infrastructure. Most of our industries have moved to infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Um, so we want to be, Helen uh, I think quite likes this phrase, we want to be the EBI for health data so that we uh, understand, curate and support those who have the responsibility. And this is it on a slide. Today we've talked a lot around uh, uh, detail of data, scale of data, but also the ability to have longitudinal longitudinal event-based data. And I would argue that Biobank is fantastic, it's world-leading, and it's sitting out here at 500,000 people. The question is, is how can we uh, increase, um, increase the denominator? 
So we built partnerships at scale. We have 21 uh, leading universities, research institutes, including Oxford, EBI, Sanger, signed up to a single institute agreement, so we can contract once across the UK. And just to show you a few things we're doing in terms of the science, we want to do the science that enables the infrastructure, both in terms of uh, tools and technologies. So we're, we're helping to describe the human phenome in a very open way to produce tools which are accessible to all, as well as applied analytics. And then we've got four research uh, themes which again illustrate science at scale and detail. Again, we don't want to fund projects which individual institutions can do themselves. So one or two examples of that. One of our priorities is clinical trials. Here's Martin from Oxford, uh, uh, research director for trials across the UK. How do we use data to really accelerate clinical trials? So this is a great study. David Price, Rory, and um, Martin are leading it. Orion 4. Can we use routine data really to accelerate identification of eligible patients? So what, in partnership with NHS Digital, which has a data set of 55 million people, is to, is to use that data set to look at uh, high-level eligibility for a cardiovascular outcome study. They can map the geographical location of patients to sites, and I understand sending out 12,000 letters a week. So how do we scale uh, sadly, not yet in Scotland, but that's uh, definitely going to come. Multimorbidity, uh, we touched upon that this morning. So again, across the UK, we're doing a four-nation study to create an e-cohort of 12 million people to look at clusters of multimorbidity and trajectories of multimorbidity. Um, phenomics, and this is um, how do we reliably define phenotypes? So through the work of Cathy, Harry, and Spiros, working with Helen and others, developing a UK-wide open source repository for EHR tools that defines algorithms and phenotypes so that we generate computable phenotypes for the UK population. And this is one of Spiros' slides. I love the fact that your phenotypic requirements depend on your domain and the question you're asking. But a good example of that, and this was in The Lancet uh, a few weeks ago, on four million people shows uh, the uh, incidence of phenotypes over the decades of life. But what Spiros and colleagues has done is taken that data from four million people, then put it on GitHub and make it available, and I understand it will be very relevant to the primary care data release of UK Biobank, and we want people to use this. So open tools, uh, 10,000 ontology terms mapped and validated against 300 diseases. Another relevant uh, research theme to this audience, led by John Dinesh and Matt out of Cambridge, is understanding the multiomic causes of disease. You'll have seen this in Nature last year. The somologic array with the genotype array, John Dinesh tells me he personally performed 36 billion tests, and basically un it unraveled new biology of the proteome. So that's on 3,300 blood donors. Question we have, can we scale that? So something that we're currently under consideration is looking at these complementary cohorts, which add up to 250,000 individuals, all of whom have multiomic data so that we can pool them for ana analyses across the cohorts, extensive molecular data with electronic health record linkage. And lastly, I've put in a slide on environmental data. This is Jill Pell from Glasgow. I'm from Scotland, as you know, the sun rarely shines in Scotland. So what she did with colleagues was look at f almost 500,000 births and link uh, maternity records to educational outcome at the age of 5 and 11 with environmental data uh, of solar radiation from NASA satellites. And they showed that learning disabilities was associated with month of birth. So if you're... If you're um, month of conception. So if you're conceived in the winter months, less U UVB exposure, then learning uh, is, uh, is not as great. So we're partnering with the Turing Institute, which is our National Institute of Data Science. We're partnering with the British Heart Foundation, who are creating a national center for, uh, for cardiovascular data science to create a phenotype 
on, uh, on folk living and at risk of cardiovascular disease in the UK, and we're delighted that the director will be appoint announced next week. We've got an outstanding director who will lead that as a national uh, British Heart Foundation uh, cardiovascular data science, working very closely with the NHS um, uh, in detail. Secondly is the people, and I've just put this slide in because we haven't talked much about training. Francis talked a little bit about it, but we think we need to train up to 10,000 data scientists, actually. Um, we're also looking at the career pathways so that this deficit between industry, academia, NHS is, is recalibrated. And can I just credit the work of Michael Dunn and others at the Wellcome Trust who've supported us in defining this career pathway, but also with, with the Turing have a PhD program for health data scientists with industry, with the NHS. And finally, the infrastructure, the most important bit. Um, the origins of this, most things in the UK lead back to John Bell. Um, so in the industrial strategy, we said we wanted digital innovation hubs to actually drive phenotyping at scale. And there's about there's a modest amount of money, about 40 million pounds is put into this. But rather than just putting money into the system and funding five more silos, we thought, how can we create an interoperable, trustworthy, scalable system? And we looked at the Global Alliance, which was terrific, and we stole a lot of ideas, thanks to Ewan's support. But also the World Wide Web Consortium, but also industry, SWIFT, GSM standard for mobile telecommunications. And often there is a neutral, well, in the SWIFT uh, example, global cooperative uh, designed to coordinate standards across the community. And that's what we're, we're, we're attempting to do. Then we went out, we spoke to 2,700 people in 350 organizations, various events with industry, patients, citizens, health providers, academics. And basically they said, we need what you've articulated today. With public trust, we need longitudinal event-based multimodal curated data sets, especially on disease subgroups. And access to those data needs to be easy. We need to be able to scale to worldwide coverage and we need to be competitive by being fast. So this is the model which is which we've, um, we're working towards. We've got patients here. We've then established a UK Health Data Research Alliance, which is a cooperative, including CPRD, Genomics England, Biobank, all the big data controllers. We're then pulling the data through into well-curated hubs and then putting a fabric, a technology infrastructure fabric on top of it, so-called data uh, gateway, to enable that dis data to be discovered and within trusted analytical environments, uh, de-identified, linked, and accessed. So that's the plan. We've been at this about a year. In terms of the alliance, we've got 18 current members, and they've brought to the table about 250 data sets. And the support we're offering is in the round the phenomics, the definition of the gateway, the public engagement, the governance, the data protection stuff, and then the analytical environments. And that's our website, which you can go on to. In terms of the hubs, we had a competition. Um, we selected seven, and in total we funded about 50 million pounds. And these are disease-focused, and I'm pleased to say there is one for eye health, oculomics, they talk it. About, thank you. Uh, <laughs> respiratory cancer, real-world evidence, inflammatory dyes, uh, bowel disease, eye health, trials in Oxford, and acute care. So scaling across the UK, and those are some of the, the hubs, and that's the sort of coverage of the UK. I won't show the video because of the time. And lastly, the gateway. We're actually in an MVP phase, working in partnership with IBM initially, but going out for a more formative technology partnership next year, and beginning to look at those, that open catalog of phenomics, uh, working with Oxford and NHS Digital. That's where we are. It's hard, um, but I think it's important. And actually, if we can benefit patients and put patients and the public at everything, at the heart of everything we do, it's the right thing to do. So I think, that in conclusion, there are opportunities for the ICDA. How do we harness large-scale data analysis and technology to power the global community in using digital and data 
for transformation of healthcare of common disease. And these are just a few principles I think we need to look at. You could be the global exemplar of team science, which would be a good thing. So I'll finish. I've got two quotes to finish. Bill Gates, uh, we overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next ten. So we mustn't be inactive. That was a good one. The Wall Street Journal, I quite like this one. The new Einsteins will be the scientists who share. From cancer to cosmology, researchers could race ahead by working together. And I do think that this community has been at the forefront of that from my early days when I learned from Mark and Jose to UK Biobank and many other things. I think this is remarkable. I should say we all have bumps on the road. We were doing very well. and We were launching all our websites, the HDR website. But then my head of communication said, HDR has been taken by havering, demolition, and recycling which is very appropriate, actually. So this is our... We had to, we had to give them a, a little bung to take the domain off them. But anyway, thank you very much for listening, and it's a privilege. To... So the, so the, the question is, there's a lot of excitement in the UK at the moment about a five million deeply phenotyped and molecularly characterized cohort for early detection of disease. Learning from the biobank experience, but scaling it and also allowing people to be recalled and also to feed information back to patients. So this is part of the industrial strategy, uh, which has three planks. Number one is genomics, which is really around the uh, genomic uh, work within Biobank. Uh, secondly is the data piece, which is um, what, what we're doing. And the third piece is about the early detection of disease. I would see that as, as requiring not only digital recruitment, but digitally enabled follow-up for ascertainment of outcomes, which is what we all want. So actually it does join together in a fairly coherent way. And they're putting about 250 million pounds into it, so it's a reasonable, reasonable investment. Will data sharing currently still from the UK buyback model? I think that is yet to be defined. Uh, it's early days. The, the question was, will the five million cohort data access model be equivalent to UK Biobank. I'm looking at Roy, I think that's yet to be defined. Yeah. So it's, it's early days. He was nodding.